Bless the Lord, amen. amen. It is so good to be with you, and thank you so much uh, to Pastors uh, Leo and, and Christine. It is such an honor. Uh, it's amazing when, when God's in the orchestration, you know you're in for something heavenly, amen. And so I just love what the Lord is doing. Uh, again, it's, I think this has been four or five years in the making, uh, but God's making it. Amen. How many people know when you know God is never late, you wait differently? When God is never late, you wait differently. There is a response that changes. And so it's incredible. We begin to think differently when we know His nature you think differently. When you know his narrative, you think differently. And so it's an incredible invitation. But it is such a joy to be with you this morning. And uh, I'm just excited to see what the Lord is wanting, not just to do with us, but what he's wanting to do through us. Because friends, it doesn't end when this service ends. You see, Christ gives us Christianity. He doesn't give us Christmas. Amen? Amen. And so when you realize it's, it's a lifestyle he gives us, not just something to do, it's actually someone to be. And I want to tell you right now, guys, you are the 67th book of the Bible. Why? Gary, the 66th. No, no, you're the 67th book of the Bible. Why? Because the world doesn't read their Bible, they read their Christians. And the question is, are people reading Lamentations or are they reading Acts of the Apostles? Because when you begin to understand that, that you are a walking encounter of God, that everything about you is, you see, when, when you show up, options change. Because you're in the room, options change. You're not just an employee, you're a heavenly plant. You're not just someone who goes to work, you're on an assignment. And you see, when you get up, when you realize, when I get up in the morning, I'm not going to work. I'm on assignment. When I go and get my coffee, I'm on assignment. And I feel like today, guys, we, we, are, we are living so much in autopilot. We're living so much in this, well, it'll, it'll, she'll be right, mate. But friends, she won't be right until the body of Christ arises and be the bride and be who God's called us to really be. Amen. And so like, I feel like I'm preaching to the converted, but I want to stir something in us today. That, that we won't just live in a place of promise, but we would live in a place of presence. That we would live in a place that, that what God is wanting to do in us, He's also doing through us. That your Christian walk is not a Christian walk of vanity, but of victory. That God is doing something. That it, there is a, an invitation that we realize that this life is not our own. That every breath that we take is an opportunity for someone to encounter the goodness of God. Everywhere we are, we are an, a walking, living, breathing encounter of possibility. And I want to encourage you, friends, when we get that understanding, no matter where we find ourselves, it is an opportunity for heaven to come. I want to encourage you right now, friends. I don't believe God... Is, and I heard it as Dave was prophesying. He said, he talked about blessing. And I feel like this is a house of blessing, but I feel like God is going to rest on this place. God isn't going to bless this place. He's going to rest on this place. You see, blessing is what God gives to you, resting what God leaves with you. And when there's a residue, when there, is, when there is a habitation more than a visitation, guys, not everything is possible. Amen? And so I want to undergird something in us today that I really believe is going to empower us to step into a maturity, into a place where God isn't just active in our life, but we begin to activate around us. I believe true discipleship is not just being active for the gospel, but activating the gospel in others. That is the sign of true discipleship. And so I want you, if you can, to turn with me to the book of James. Let's make this meeting legal. Amen? Yeah. James, as you can tell from my accent, I'm from Tasmania. And so, <laughs> no, I'm actually from Wales. And so if you love rugby or revival, then we can talk. Amen? Uh, just depending on what time of the month it is, it's, uh, it's going to be revival. If it's going well, it'll be rugby. 
James chapter 1. Friends, I really believe that a couple of months ago, probably six, seven months ago, I've been on a journey. And the journey I've been on is this journey of God wanting to bring wholeness to me. God wanting to bring maturity into my life. And you see, maturity isn't connected with age. Maturity is connected with thinking. Maturity is connected with posture. Maturity is connected with, with not what you think, but how you think. And I've been on this journey, and, and without going into full details for the sake of time, in December last year, I weighed 102 kilos. My wife said I had a body like a god. Yes, Buddha. But it's like, it was like my Middle East was invading everything. And so it was incredible. I went on this journey, and it was all to do with this place of wholeness. Now, friends, I'm not throwing shade on anyone. It's my journey, not yours. But I found myself in literally the, the beginning of February, and the Lord gave me two words. And in this moment, it's, it's been this journey of me cold plunging and intermittent fasting, which is a whole other message in itself. Yeah, I love cold plunging. Any cold plungers amongst us? I'm telling you, it is a baptism. <laughs> it is a self-baptism. I tell you, you know, it's not the baptism of Jesus. It's not even the baptism of John. Amen. It is a baptism of whatever you want it to be. But it's incredible in this place. I've been discovering in God that it's all to do with really bringing my body into Sabbath. Because you see, fasting isn't about giving up. It's about giving in. And that's a whole other message I, I can't get into this morning. But how many people know when the Lord invites you into something, everything comes and tests it? And so when the Lord began to speak to me about what, what I, I really wanted to step into, I opened the cupboard in my kitchen and all of a sudden these M&Ms fell out. Devil, get behind me. And I'm looking at these M&Ms and I hear these two words. And this is what I want to lay here this morning. The Lord said, mission and maturity. And I went to a, a market and, and again, I see this incredible stall selling these cakes and above it was M and M and I'm like Lord what are you saying and again he said mission and maturity and then he began to speak firmer and I love it how the Lord really really gives it to us amen so clearly I, I tell you we read the Bible like finding Nemo just keep swimming just keep swimming just keep snug friends I don't believe the Bible is finding Nemo I don't believe the, the Bible is Disney I believe the Bible is like Liam Nielsen from Taken. I have a particular set of skills that I have acquired over time that I will find you. His word finds us. His discipleship and correction finds us. It ain't about just keep swimming, just keep swimming. No, no, I will find you. And I was found by the Lord. And this is what he said to me. He said, Gary, get up and grow up. Get up and grow up. And I'm like, Lord, what is this? He said, COVID can no longer be an excuse. Friends, if you've got a business that's been affected, that isn't a punishment, that's a pruning because God's bringing fruitfulness. You see, whenever something happens in my life, I, I don't ask to go into spiritual warfare. I ask the question, God, what are you saving me for and what are you saving me from? And this place of, of what has happened to us this last three years, I believe has robbed the church of mission. That we become so insular, we become so in, inward, God is restoring mission back to the church. There is a mission and a maturity that he's inviting us into. And so in James chapter 1, I love this. That we realize there's an invitation here. And I remember as a pastor, I would write all these, these letters of resignation. I probably had about 12 or 13 and I just keep them on my Mac. And, and I remember other pastors, you know, messaging me, Gary, have you got a word for me? I feel like I, I, I'm going to give up. Have you got a word for me? I said, yes, I have, my friend. James chapter 1. What does it say? Count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith is producing. You see, if you're going to count your joy, you need to make your joy count. If you're going to count your blessings, you've got to make your blessings count. It's an invitation of realizing I'm not just going to count it all joy. I'm actually going to make my joy count. If I'm going through something right now, I'm going to make the joy count. 
I'm going to do it with a smile on my face. I'm going to do it. And that's, friends, that's what cold plunging does to me. I'll tell you, I, I was there one day going to speak at a church, and I just like, I'm just going to cancel. I'm just going to do that prophet thing and just cancel. <laughs> and Sarah said, suck it up, princess, and get in the pool. <laughs> and I went out, and I jumped in, and I just sat, stood there for 90 seconds. I came out, friends, I tell you, I could have raised the dead. Something shifted in. Why? Because I began to count it all joy. And that's the invitation of James here. Count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces. What does it produce? It produces endurance. Another word is patience. I feel like right now, guys, God is wanting endurance in the church. Because we ain't for in for a sprint, we're in for a marathon. And this is what I love. Count it all joy, brethren, when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces. Friends, what you're going through right now is not in vain. It's producing something. There's fruit from your trial. It's fruit from your trial. No matter what is happening, it's producing something. And this is the beautiful invitation is, guess what? I'm going to get something out of this. And the Bible tells us what we're going to get because in the next verse it says, but let patience have its perfect work. Yeah. Knowing that it's producing endurance, but let that have its perfect work. You see, God is a God of promise, but He's also a God of process. Yeah. Yes. And the danger comes is, is we check into the promise, but we check out of a process. If God wasn't a God of process, then Jesus would have come as a man, not as an embryo. He would have come as an embryo. But he came as an embryo. He didn't come as a man. I could have imagined the session where, where Jesus came in. It would have been at his baptism. We could have had Christopher Nolan or maybe Peter Jackson do the, do the production. But in comes Jesus. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You see, we expect the spectacular entrance and God says, I plant a seed. You see, if you want to see it, you've got to seed it. When you realize everything begins in the unseen, you begin to go into a place of trust, not just faith. And when trials happen, they're not happening to you to punish you. They're happening to you so something can be produced in you. And this is where Romans 8.28 comes in. Because it happens in such a way, it feels like God has, God has done this, but He hasn't. It's the enemy. But what the Lord does, He takes what the enemy does and he turns it around as if God made it work together for good because I love him and called according to his purposes. Am I speaking to somebody? Yeah. You see, the enemy may have cost you to lose your business, but what God is producing and restoring in you is heavenly. Yeah? You see, when you have a perspective of heaven when it comes to trial and tribulation, friends, I want to encourage you that all of a sudden we realize that God is doing something. You see, God is a God of process and promise. And when He speaks a word of you, how many people have received a prophetic word and it's like everything else opposite happens? Why? Because all of a sudden the lights go out because the seed's gone in the ground. But when you and your trust and your faith begin to water and begin to allow God to do something, all of a sudden the shoots begin to happen and God begins to grow something in you. Am I speaking to somebody? Yeah. But let patience or endurance have its perfect work that you may be perfect, complete, and lacking nothing. Lacking nothing. You see, when you realize that what, is, what God can do in you is greater than what ever can happen to you, friends, everything changes. You lack nothing. You see, when, when you know you lack nothing, you live differently. Yes. When you know you lack nothing, you speak differently. When you know you lack nothing, you think differently. I remember years ago, this pastor messaged me to say, you know, he had all these, this thing come against him. And I said to Sarah, hey, honey, I think we need to take this, this pastor couple out for dinner. We, um, we want to bless them. Just love on them. How many people just love loving on people? Yes. It's not like they're bad. It's like just life has just thrown them a curveball. And so I said, we're going to love on them. And so 
We went and to Florida. We flew into Florida. We were in, uh, I think, Chicago at that time. And we flew into Florida. And all of a sudden, I said to Sarah, let's take them to this restaurant. It's a really nice restaurant. It's okay. Someone's just given us a gift. We can, we can do this. Because how many people know when you live by faith, silver and gold of you none? Amen? You're looking for fishes everywhere. And so I said, Sarah, don't worry. We've got a blessing. We, we can do this. And so five minutes before we were going to leave, I, I had this check in my spirit. Really, you better check your account. I checked my account. I had 67 cents in my account. I didn't tell my wife. That's when you start walking on water. And so we went to the restaurant. We sat down. And you know, when you know that you lack, you think differently. When you know you lack, you choose differently. And I'm looking at the salad. I'm looking at thinking, yeah, I'll, I'll just do it. Guys, I didn't care what I looked at. I couldn't even, I couldn't even afford the salad. And they there opposite me going, oh, oh, we think we'll have a starter. I think, oh, yeah, let's, let's, let's have a few oyster. I'm thinking, I am sweating. And so I thought, I'm done. Guys, go for your life. Go for your, I couldn't even afford the bread. I can't even afford a breadstick right now. Just go for your life. Yes, get, yeah, well, chuck some wine in there as well. And I am sweating, and they're coming, and, and, they, and of course, they chose the lobster, of course. Yeah, yeah, we'll have truffle butter with that. Of course, just, it is piling up, and I'm doing the calculations in my mind. I am sweating. And so after dessert, I get up, and I walk to the, I walk to the bathroom, and, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm praying, God, let me find a fish or something. Let me, someone's dropped a couple of grand. Let me just, I'm looking under the seat. Uh, you know, maybe there's some drug barons. I'm lifting the toilet, thinking something's under there, and nothing. And I walk back out, and as I'm walking back out, the waiter's coming towards me. And I'm thinking, oh, he knows. He knows I'm a runner. I'm looking at him, I think, I could run, and he ain't going to get me. He's a, bit, he's a bit bigger than me. And he walks straight up to me, and he grabs my arm, and I'm thinking, he, he sussed me out. He said, sir, I just need to let you know, someone's covered your meal tonight. I'm like, what? I'm thinking, can I, I just want to kiss you. I just want to kiss you. I said, who are He said, oh, someone recognized you and said, yeah, he said, they've even covered dessert, so go for your life. When you know you lack nothing, you order differently. When you know that God's got it, you live differently. You see, when God presents us with a menu, why are we choosing just minimal Christianity when God is asking us to lay hold of signs and wonders? There is a menu coming down for you, GGC, that God is not asking you just to choose a nice little outreach on a Saturday. He's asking you to choose salvation, signs and wonders, community transformation, them things that He wants you to reach for. Because when you lack nothing, you order differently. And we can't allow a narrative of trial to cause us to think we lack when we realize if I'm being buffeted, God's producing something. I am a transaction center for the richness of God. That no matter what comes against me, God's producing something. I want to encourage you right now, friends, that God is bringing us into this place of endurance because He is producing something. He's requiring and inquiring of us an upgrade in our thinking. When you realize you've got an upgrade in your thinking, when you realize I have a renewed thinking, friends, everything changes. I want to encourage you. We, we move from a place of leadership to stewardship. Lord told me years ago, he said, the greatest resources being released in this day are not going to be to leaders, but to stewards. Why? Because leaders manage, but stewards multiply. That your life is a life of stewardship. But I get to steward my trial, and I get to steward my triumph. I get to steward my victory, but I get to steward my vulnerability. You see, we've got to step into the revelation that it's not either or, it's both and. But I know as much as I'm trialed, I know as much as I'm triumphing. Yeah? Friends, you have an incredible building. I want to tell you right now, buildings don't change lives. 
but what goes on inside them does. And you see, you don't come to a building, you come to the potential of God doing societal change to a place. You come to what God is fashioning and building. You come to be a part of. You see, every partner in this place, every person that connects to GGC, friends, you are part of the tapestry of transformation that God is doing in this nation. You're a part of it. You're not a witness, you're a participator. You see, if we sit back and say, oh, well, that's okay for others. No, no, it's okay for you because God is doing in and through you everything that He's wanting to do. You see, God is releasing mission and maturity, something that we get to put our hands to and something we get to put our hearts to. And no matter what is happening in our life, friends, it is producing something beautiful. Turn to Hebrews 10. I believe Hebrews and James is such an invitation right now of us stepping into in 2024. In Hebrews 10, it says in verse 35, Therefore do not cast away your confidence, which is great reward. How many people know in this place when trials happen, you lose your confidence? When someone accuses you, when someone says something, when stuff doesn't happen like you expected, you lose confidence. You don't show up like you used to. You don't show up like people expect because your confidence has been hit. But there's an invitation here in Hebrews, therefore don't cast it away. Have confidence that what is happening in me is greater than what can happen to me. I'll tell you, I, I welcome, I used to get these letters. I used to be on these websites, you know, end time prophetic watch and and falseprofit.com and, and all these things. And people say to me, Gary, you're on that website. And I'm like, did they spell my name with one R or two? Because if they spelt it with two, there's going to be a problem. But if they spelt it with one, God's got my address. It's the right person. Because every accusation brings an upgrade. Everything someone says something, there's an upgrade. And I tell you, I am a walking testimony of every time there's, there has been a buffeting, God gives an upgrade. Yes. And I want to encourage you right now as we orientate our hearts yeah. to realizing I lack nothing. I am not casting away my confidence for I know that God you are producing. And you see, the word producing is where we get the word produce from. And produce belongs on a table. Produce belongs in in community. You see, what God is producing in you becomes produce that other people get to feast on. Your testimony literally becomes a, a, a release. It becomes a victory for others. You see, we know this. We don't reach a nation. We don't reach a city by our victories. We reach it by our vulnerabilities. But the beautiful thing is, my vulnerability becomes your victory. Because it permissions you to realize, wait a minute. If he can overcome, I can overcome. If he can count it all joy, guess what? I can count it all joy. And that's why the writer of Hebrews is inviting us not to cast away our confidence. Because it goes on in verse 36, it says, For you have need of endurance. Not Red Bull, endurance. Endurance. Yeah? Yeah. Guys, I fear, you're my heart, I fear we treat prophetic words, I fear we we treat scripture, we we treat worship songs like Red Bull. I just need a a pick-me-up. No, no, no. You don't need a pick-me-up, you need a purpose. You see, when pressure replaces passion, you lose your purpose. But when you've got a purpose... Passion begins to be a magnet to everything you do in your purpose. And you see, I I feel like sometimes we lose purpose. We lose our way because we lose our why. Have you ever asked yourself, why do you do what you do? Why did you come this morning? Why did you give this morning? Why did you show up this morning? That's your why. 
And when you've got a why, you've got a way. But when you haven't got a why, friends, you lose your purpose. And then you begin to live in an autopilot place. But we have need of endurance, as Hebrews tells us. Why? So that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. What is the will of God? How many people want to know the will of God for their life? Everyone wants to know the will of God. Let me give you the will of God for your life. It's in Thessalonians. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in everything give thanks. For this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. <laughs> if I don't know His will, I do His will. I rejoice always. Gary, how the heck can you rejoice always? I'm always rejoicing. Rejoice is literally to be, mean rejoy. I'm just going to add more joy to this. I'm just going to top up the joy. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing. How the heck can you pray without ceasing? Smith Wigglesworth was asked, how often do you pray, Smith Wigglesworth? He said, I don't pray for more than five minutes, but I don't go five minutes without praying. That's lifestyle. And in everything, give thanks. I believe thanksgiving opens gates. Thanksgiving is the password to divine things. You see, hope says please, but faith says thank you. Hope says please, but faith says thank you. Thanksgiving opens things. It is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. So if you don't know the will, do His will. And I know in that then all things become known. Why? Because the Bible says the secret things belong to the Lord, but that which is revealed belongs to me. I don't rent revelation, I own it. Yeah? Am I speaking to someone? There is a maturity that is coming to the body of Christ that God is releasing. I believe He is taking us into a place of releasing such incredible things. Friends, that we know what we're about, we know who we are, and we're unapologetic about it. This is a discipleship. Friend, you're my heart. If I hear another word about mentorship or internship, I'm going to kill someone. I'm, I, friends, you my heart. It's not about mentorship. It's not about internship. It's about discipleship. Yes. The issue is, is we've changed the ingredients, therefore we've changed the experience. My, my daughter, my son, my wife is gluten intolerant. Why? Because someone changed the ingredients. You see, the Bible says that Jesus is the bread of life. I wonder why the world is intolerant of Jesus. Because we've changed the ingredients. When you change the ingredients, you change the experience. Friend, I want to encourage you right now. Don't change the ingredients of the gospel. Because if you do, you change the experience. We have to go seek a sensitive instead of seeking the sensitive. Am I speaking to someone? I'm all for being sensitive. And I'm all for seeking the sensitive, but I'll never be seeker sensitive. Amen? You see, when you change the ingredients, you change the experience. And I believe discipleship is God's mandate for the body of Christ right now. Friends, you and I have no lawyering words, but I, I think what we do is, is we borrow words from the world to try and get an outcome that can never happen. Why? Because it's like trying to raise a mule and trying to reproduce a mule. You can't do it. It'll happen for one moment, but it'll never happen again. But disciples beget disciples beget disciples beget disciples. Amen? Am I speaking to somebody? I'd love the keyboardist to come back if he can. Friends, we are stepping into right now a becoming. We are stepping into that God is producing. That Friends, I am looking at a group of people that God is producing something in you that you are fertile ground, that, that whatever has come against you, whatever is warring in your mind, whatever you feel is, is hitting you, whatever you feel is coming against you. I feel the Lord saying today, fields of gold. Fields of gold. Because I am producing. There is a harvest in the happening. There is a harvest in whatever is taking place in our world. You see, when we come to Christ, friends, it's not about become. It's about becoming. Mark 1, 17, I love this. Jesus comes. Man, I love that. Come on. Where the Lord is, the Lord is. Wow. 
Man. There's a well. In Mark 1.17, it says, Jesus said, follow me. And he didn't say, I'll make you fishers of men. He says, I will make you become. There is a becoming. And so if you come here today thinking your trials disqualify you, if you come here today thinking everything about you, that you have to get your ducks in a row. Friend, I'll, I'll just say quack, quack right now to you. Amen. If you come here today saying, God, this has to happen, this has to happen, this. You see, this is what I love about the Father. He doesn't call the qualified, He qualifies the called. He doesn't call the perfect, He perfects the called. We are the becoming of God, amen? And no situation, circumstance or situation disqualifies you, nullifies you from the call of God that's on your life. And so the greatest battleground right now isn't you. It's you. It's you. And I feel like the Lord wants to turn off the noise and turn up His voice because you are the becoming of God. That what is happening to you, there is a maturity that's taking place. And I feel like today, Friends, that we're in a house right now that will bring many sons to glory. We're in a house right now of not mentorship or internship. We're in a house of discipleship. We're in a house where God is bringing. And so I want us right now, if you've been in a season or situation where you feel like hell is at your door, everything is against you right now, just want you to put your hand on your heart. I'm going to minister in a moment, but just put your hand on your heart because I feel like the Lord wants to up you. You see, one of the, the giftings of the prophetic isn't to see, but to cause to see. And I feel like there is a lens that God wants to release on this house right now. There is a lens. You see, should have gone to spec savers, isn't going to cut it. But there is a throne room revelation that the Lord is inviting us into. That if we were to lay hold of not what to see, but how to see, it changes everything. And all we need to do is to give up our right to know, to give up our right to understand, and to say, Father, whatever you're doing, do a work in me right now. Whatever you're doing, whatever you need to add, whatever you need to take away, Whatever you need to prune or whatever you need to prosper, Lord, I ask you to do it now. That God, I would not see my estranged family as a problem, but as a purpose of a miracle. That I will not see that speeding fine or that bill or that land tax or them, that rate notice. Lord, I wouldn't see it as a problem, but I would see it as an opportunity for a miracle. Because what is happening to me pales in comparison of what God you're doing in me. That this light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for me a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. That he who began a good work is faithful to complete it. That he who began a good work is faithful to complete it. So as you put your hand on your heart right now, friend, I ask you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Father, do a work in me for the glory of your name. That I count it all joy for every trial and for every tribulation knowing God that you're producing, knowing that you're fashioning, knowing that you're forging. In Jesus' name.